This episode of the King's Hall is brought to you by Ideal Poultry and our supporters at Patreon.com. Whenever any sociological feature becomes pronounced in a society, that feature will, of course, have its advocates, its prophets and priests. I would argue that the new militant atheism that has appeared in our midst over the last decade can actually be understood as the intellectual vanguard of our fatherlessness. Fatherlessness, as it turns out, has its apologists. These men are able to defend fatherlessness quite capably, for they were in fact shaped by it and want in turn to shape it further. They want to make more of what made them. But there is a perverse twist in this. Father hunger made them, and so this means that what they want to usher in is a larger famine for others. An excerpt from Father Hunger by Douglas Wilson. You're listening to the King's Hall Podcast, making self-ruled men who rule well and win the world. Well, welcome to this episode of the King's Hall Podcast. Gentlemen, it is fantastic to be with you. I don't know why, but today I feel like I've been watching some Top Gun. Uh-huh. And I feel like we need call signs. I I was hoping that you would bring it up because it's such a good idea, and I have so many good ideas that I wanted to share the wealth. I so think that's you. the right thing to do. I would obviously be Leroy Jenkins, but Dan, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, just so we're clear, from this point forward, my call sign will be Death Blade. How about you, Captain? What's your call sign? I will be Captain Raymond Holt. Uh -huh, I knew you wouldn't play ball. And that is why your call sign is Wet Blanket. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. The I don't think you get to pick your own call sign. I, you don't. No, it's bestowed on you by other men, like yeah. masculinity. But yeah. Dan, I don't know. what Viking? Viking. Viking. Calvin. Raider. Bald head. I mean, <laughs> does it really? <laughs> it really does. Yeah. Oh, man. I feel bad. I, one of my kids, his name is Calvin, and he has real trouble growing hair. I mean, he's only mm -hmm. two, but. It is poor, kind poor of a weird guy. one. What about Pillager? Pillager? Because okay. it's like a Viking, you know? Or, you know, we could always go like in the movie. Uh, the one guy's name was just Bob. And they're like, what's your call sign? He was like, Bob. <laughs> they're like, well, what's your name? Bob. You it's, know, I've, it's Bob. It's I feel Bob. bad because you guys are being very generous with my call sign, and I would call Brian like Sweetie or something like that. The I sweet would, Psalmist of I Ogden. Wouldn't answer. I mean, I just simply wouldn't answer. The that. problem is, <laughs> Sweet Psalmist of Ogden is long on a helmet. It's yeah, it, it wouldn't work. Well, that's work. why you call him Sweetie. I prefer to be something like <laughs> Swordsman <laughs> or. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know what, guys? The King's Hall Podcast now too. Now too. Hang up the headphones, and I leave. <laughs> that's all it took? That's, that was it. That was that's, it. That's all you had to do, I'd take Frenchmen. Like, if you're going to do an insulting one, at least that one has the potential. There have been But you're not even French. You're French-Canadian. And, yeah, that's that's a good point. <laughs> Canadian actually is just an insult at this point. We could call you Makaday. 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 <laughs> doesn't that mean black? Oh, it's <laughs> I don't know big, what it means. I don't it? speak. No, Gitchy is big in oh, Ojibwe. Gitchy. It, and, uh, oh, Gitchy. Makaday is black. So Gitchy, you... Gitchy, Makaday, Kwe is big, big black woman. Interesting. We could call you Gitchy. I would not. Again. I would, okay. <laughs> no, call signs, bad idea. Anyway. Call signs, here we are. Speaking of Gitchy, Gitchy, we have a big, big episode today. <laughs> Stop appropriating my culture. <laughs> what a segue, though. So we'll leave that to our listeners. If you guys have ideas for call signs, you can send those to us on social media. We're into episode two of Fatherlessness. Actually, episode three, if you count the introduction. So we talked about symptoms last time. This episode, we're going to be talking about the causes. And Dan, how did we get to this point in our culture? And as we do this, gentlemen, we're going to look at the causes. I think it's also going to set up a lot of the content for the rest of season two. I'm really this glad you is... didn't have a question there because I was not ready. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's going to be questions. Eric <laughs> Eric includes you in the conversation by saying your name, and I love it. But, it but has sometimes it brings to terror. <laughs> sometimes he's like, you know, and Brian, I just, I'm wondering if you can do any differential equations for You're us like, right now. And, and I'm like, where no, are we? I cannot. Where are we? <laughs> oh, I cannot. I cannot do that. <laughs> Eric, thank you. Yes, it is my pleasure. Point number one, gentlemen. We're looking at the causes of our cultural decay, particularly regarding fatherlessness. And Brian, this gets to the quote that you read from Douglas Wilson. Yeah. Number one, atheism is the intellectual vanguard of fatherlessness. So one of the things that he's pointing out in the book, and he references uh, all the work he had done on the documentary and debates with Christopher Hitchens. And really what he talks about is that the thing that really set Christopher off as an atheist was the idea that God is a father— who has sovereign care over his creation. 
Yeah. So the first question is just why do you think this was – I think I think Doug's right. A, do you think he's right? And B, why? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked last episode about the cosmic fatherhood of God sitting at the foundation of all of reality. The, 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 you can go all the way down to the bottom, and what do you find? You find a father there, mm. the fatherhood of God. And so when we're talking about atheism, we're talking about a rejection of a father. We're talking about a rejection of patriarchy in, 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 a, in, a, in a sense. And so that's why one of the reasons even that we've been so strong on our need to recover like a sexed piety, the recovery of God, godly biblical masculinity and fatherhood in culture and, and godly biblical femininity and motherhood in culture is because Actually, getting that wrong is much more foundational than some people think. Some people think that these are just sort of down, way downstream doctrines that don't have a lot to do with much, but really at the root, there's a father, and that means that fatherhood is going to be a tectonic kind of issue. So atheists, they get it wrong at the beginning, and one of the ways they get it wrong at the beginning is by erasing really plugging their ears, closing their eyes, and shouting, no, 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 the fatherhood of God. Why do you think, Dan, that the atheism— so we had that whole movement. It was kind of going on concurrently with the young, restless, and reformed. But new atheism was coming on the scene, like the OOs. It was really, yeah. really popular. Sam Harris, people like this. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about why that was at that point in our— American history. Yeah, it was really interesting. During that time, the New Atheist Movement, um, uh, they were very militant, very yes. aggressive, very aggressive. And, you know, I, I, not to change the subject, I'll, I'll, I'll circle around to New Atheism, but, you know, this question about fatherlessness and atheism, I mean, I don't know if we want to really delve into the topic too much, but it, you can't really talk about it without talking about the French Revolution. Yeah. Right, which was a complete like shrugging off of mm -hmm. church fathers, uh the aristocracy, the gentry, like the the fathers that had been in place in France and and the result of that became individualism, radical individualism and forms of democracy. You know, to where I am the ultimate rule. I don't need a father of, you know, to tell me who God is or what is a just law, you know, what is what is justice. And so, I mean, the fruit is it, it would make sense that eventually you would get to a point to where you would have these kind of like in the bubbling cauldron of human sin and perversion that you'd get a big bubble that pops that's like new atheism is like mm -hmm. this anti-intellectual in a lot of ways. They want to they want to make themselves seem like they're intellectuals, but yeah. they're actually not very good thinkers. <clears throat> and then they're really aggressive about it. Yeah. So it makes sense that that would be one of the bubbles that would come up to the surface, you know, as a fruit all the way reaching back to the French Revolution. Mm. That re also, I think, just underscores this truism that it's one of those things that once you see it anywhere, you see it everywhere. And it's what we talked about in season one with Nietzsche in the the death of God, right, mm -hmm. the quote-unquote death of God. They killed God, and it wasn't like they just then, there was nothing. It was that that's a job opening. Any culture that attempts to kill God or attempts to undermine his authority will see it as a job opening. And so the paradox you get with the new atheism, the new atheists in their militancy is that they're basically saying, there's no God, imagine there's no heaven, there's no one over you telling you what to do, and so listen to what I say and believe what I say or else. Believe that everything is meaningless or else. And you're like, or else, or else what? If you're, yeah. if you're correct, what does it matter if I agree with you or not? So they ultimately make themselves fathers. What, what is Dawkins and Dennett and Hitchens? Oh, they're just trying to be your dad. Like they're just trying to tell you what is, you know, what to think and what to do and what to be, how to behave. And yeah, in a weird way, like Hitchens and Dawkins, when they were kind of in their heyday, to me, they struck me as like early versions of Jordan Peterson, um, less grounded in any sort of what Jordan would call Judeo Christian Western. I dropped the Judeo, but still Western thought. Jordan is more in that camp, but they they really weren't at all. It struck me at the end of Doug's quote uh, that we read in the cold open. They want to make more of what made them. Yeah, this is one of those Dougisms that's like, 
I read it and I read it again, and you could sit there and just profoundly think about why that's the case. Yeah. And he goes on, he says, there's a perverse twist. The father hunger that made them, and so this means that what they want to usher in is a larger famine for others. I think what you're seeing culturally is a longing for fathers, right? This is the hunger. But then the response to that is not what we're saying, which is let's be great fathers, but theirs is let's have more of it. Mm. Let's have more of the father hunger. And something I was thinking about is we're talking about fatherlessness and atheism it really underscores that fatherlessness is at root a theological problem. Amen. Something that, Brian, you when you were uh, preaching through Matthew and the Lord's Prayer, it begins with our Father. Our Father. And that is not inconsequential. Mm-hmm. So we're actually trained as Christians to think of our entire existence as relating to a Father, mm-hmm. our Father who art in heaven. It's interesting if you look at American culture, too. Doug recounts this in his book. There's this kind of trajectory yeah. in this slow shift. First, America goes Unitarian. Yep. So there's still a God, but God is one entity. He's just one thing. He's non-Trinitarian. Then we go deist. So now God is a distant clockmaker. We, we believe he's there, but he's distant. Yeah, he's a first mover. He's a logos. He's a rational principle. He's whatever. But he's not. he doesn't care about you. He's not a father. That's right. And then that gives us the third progression, which is kind of like you could say we're in like the third progression of our downfall as a culture maybe – we just get full-blown atheism, which says that God doesn't exist. So I think one thing that we'll have to continue to unpack in this season, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we can't have robust fatherhood without Trinitarian theology. What's interesting is that you might even posit a fourth way of following atheism because people still have a spiritual hunger, and so they still they just dislocate that spiritual hunger on atheism to the, the unholy trinity in the fourth wave of me, myself, and I. Mm-hmm. They just deify the man, man, man deified. Yeah, I think that's a good point. There's there are also movements of uh, ancient <laughs> paganism that yep. that I find to be really strange. Coming back, how do you mean? Yeah, well, so if if you if you're out on the interwebs, like crazy things like Viking type ancient. Well, this is actually the uh, Jack Donovan. Uh, he's the homosexual way of men. <laughs> goes down to the like. Well, he is. I mean, the it's true. Yeah, the uh, well, he was at uh, a lot of the Manosphere stuff in mm-hmm. in Orlando. But here's this guy, like, teaching about masculinity, and the religion he's trying to bring back, Dan, is barbarianism. Yeah, it's really strange. Or, like, stoicism has yeah. is, is, is been big. I, I mean, it, so I think that there's definitely Brian is going – what you said is right, is, like, deif- deification yeah. of self. Even in, like, uh, a lot of the New Age kind of stuff, that's ultimately what's happening is that yep. you're deifying yourself, you're you're manifesting your own, yeah. um, you know, fortunes and you're destiny and things your like that. Latent psychic abilities to manifest your own destiny, which is just another way of saying you are a little god. You, yeah, yeah, you're manipulating the universe to do as you please, yeah. you know, or whatever. So, I, yeah, so I mean, essentially, what's happened is that you spiral. At that point, when you become god, then everything spirals out of control. So, yeah. I want to trace an interesting trend because I think you're right. I think fundamentally what men do when they're caught in this atheistic cesspool is you, you kind of careen off nihilism, right? Um, this Jordan Peterson talks about that, that oftentimes what happens is for, for Nietzsche, for anybody in the nihilistic camp, it, it ultimately ends in just suicide and nothingness, right? But what's interesting, how do people in our generation respond to it? You know, it could be, as we'll talk about in a minute, it could be through the sexual self, uh, the psychedelic self, but there's this tendency in men to always go back to something that our fathers were doing, which I find quite ironic. So really what we're trying to do in New Christendom, we're looking back at the blood of kings and the people in our lineage and our heritage. We're looking at Abraham. We're looking at men like Alfred the Great, and we're saying we actually want to recover some things that our fathers built. Maybe we do it a little different, but in any camp, it seems like even in barbarianism, We'd say it's utterly stupid, but what are they doing? They're trying to recover what, quote unquote, their fathers mm-hmm. had built. So I think that is one of the tendencies. Yeah, I wonder if that's a design feature in you know uh, in humanity. Well, that's what I mean to, to look back and to have reverence for ancient things. Yeah, you know, yeah. in a way. I uh, I mean, the ancient Romans did this. They respected uh, the Jews because their religion was old. I mean, ultimately, they destroyed them. But yeah. but for a while, they they enjoyed certain privileges, the Jewish people in the Roman Empire, because 
their religion was ancient. And they honored their so fathers, old. which was huge to the Roman. Yeah, and they, they didn't bow down the, to pressure, so yeah. they really respected them. What's interesting as well is that whenever you see men create their own, their new, new deified fathers, Odin, Thor, yourself, whatever it is, you always end up creating a god in your own image. So, so the problem for his fallen mankind with the fatherhood of God is that that father is holy. Mm-hmm. He's righteous. And so he, he's not just a baptized version or a stronger version of fallen sinful man, like the Greek and Roman gods. I mean, they're just, they're out there sleeping with women and they're sowing their wild oats and getting in fights with their goddess wives. And they're just like, they're basically people. They're just people who are strong and can throw lightning down and never die like that. They're just us bigger, you know? So we always end up doing that. And, and you, you always therefore run into this problem wherever you try to replace the fatherhood of God with some fake version, is you run into this problem of God's righteousness that this is why there's only one way. There's only the truth, the way, the life, that's Christ. Because only Christ can reconcile us to the Father, where we get God as Father, get over this righteousness problem and the gap there, and every other attempt is going to be some kind of human ladder where we make a fake version of fatherhood deify it but it's always just us at the end of the day yeah one of the questions i want to ask practically it seems like as we engage people in our midst who may claim to be atheists or people who have a feminist bent or whatever it is it seems like correct me if i'm wrong one of the things you have to do is look past the thing that they want to talk about like a new atheist is not going to say hey i really suffer with father hunger but it seems like pastorally you just need to know that that's going on dan yeah so i think uh At the root of a lot of this that we're talking about, there's a identity issue. Like you don't one of the one of the things that a good father does, and we we all know this is true, is that they leave an identity. Mm. Like here's what you are, here's what you are for, here's a target to hit. And we can see this as we read history, and you're like, this guy's name was like Edward the Eighth, you know, and he can look back and he's like, all of the other Edwards that came before me were identified with this. Here's my family crest. Here's our family motto, you know, and, and, or even, even in more basic, like blue collar terms, like I'm a Smith. My father was a Smith. Yeah. You know, we were all Smiths, uh, blacksmiths, you know, we were, that's, that's what we do. Um, and we have remnants of that today in some families to where it's like, you know, you have like the Scottish hot bloodedness or, you know, quick to anger or whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Some of those echoes though. Uh, still exist. And with an atheist or a feminist, the father hunger is, is blatantly obvious because they have no identity. And so they attach themselves to some sort of movement. The movement they're treating kind of like a father Mm. in a way to give them identity, to give them purpose. But at the root, they know that it's hollow. And so when you're interacting with these people, interacting with them on the basis of just their arguments is kind of frivolous because at the core, they don't even know what they're for. And it leads to, like you said, a black pilled sort of nihilism to where they realize there is no purpose for me to exist. There's no purpose for me to exist. And so when you're ministering to these people, one of the ways that it's best to uh, interact with them, again, is not necessarily just on the basis of their arguments, but to actually give them hope to show them that they were created for a purpose, that they're an image bearer of God, even if their earthly father abandoned them and let them down, that there is a heavenly father that has imprinted his image on them and that they're of eternal value. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the cores of the gospel. And so I think you have to look past the arguments in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I think one of the other applications would be in our own families. Like if you want to, you know, protect your kids against the new atheism, for example, one of the best ways you can do that is be a good father. Yeah. I mean, that's going to help uh, protect your own. Uh, gentlemen, I want to move on now to point number two in terms of causes of fatherlessness in our culture. And this one is a very large one. This is the sexual revolution, particularly focusing on the 1960s. Of all the time periods in America, this seems to be the one that was the ultimate where was dad moment Yeah, when this was happening. I remember on a plane catching, oh, maybe a quarter of one Mad Men episode. So this is Madison Avenue, big execs in the 50s type time period. Uh, John Hamm's character 
it was really interesting because, you know, he's fornicating, cheating on his wife. Just seems like, from what I could tell, a total human piece of garbage in the show. But then it's interesting because he comes home and he's, like, trying to love his wife. She's like, I just, I just have these nervous issues. And he's like, well, just go to a shrink and take the drugs and do the thing and whatever you want, honey. And it was kind of a good picture of, like, what had started to go wrong. You could see the nuclear family, healthy. Yeah. But then he, like, didn't really want anything to do with his family. So he's like, yeah, just go take the drugs. Do what the Freudian guy tells you. It'll be okay. That's sort of the anti-father because you're not protecting your daughters or your sons. And you're not protecting your wives. So, Dan, if you would maybe just unpack for people, why do fathers in particular have a role in protecting the sexuality of their wives and daughters? Where do we see that in Scripture? Yeah, well, I I mean, I think it, it ties back to the identity Again, when you're given an identity, you know your purpose, mm. right? That's part that comes with it. You know, like I said, the blacksmith knows he's going to work with metal. Mm. You know, he, he knows his purpose. Well, if you have a good father, he should be able to tell you what your sexuality is for. You know, and, and obviously the heavenly father tells you that as well. Uh, one of the first things you see in the scriptures is like, your sexuality is for creating new eternal beings. It's for procreation. It's to make more children. And when you think about that, it's actually insane. I mean, you know, having your wife carry a child is is a, an amazing experience. But then the realization that you had some participation in the creation of an image bearer of God that's going to live eternally. Mm-hmm. You participated in that, even if it was in a very small way, mm-hmm. insert jokes here. But... Um, that's that's one of the things that you can see. It's also not to be shared with anybody. It's supposed to be in a covenant. That's how the Father relates to us, mm-hmm. is in covenants, which has boundaries and terms, and it will produce blessings or curses if you go outside of the covenant. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, those are two of the ways that I would think about it, is what is your sexuality for and who is it for? So those are yeah. two of the ways. I, I don't know if you guys would have anything to add. Yeah, I, I was going to... Say, too, just even, uh, Brian, we've been talking about modesty, um, and you've got the father. The first thing post-sin, Genesis 3, that happens is that the father clothes the nakedness of his people. Yeah. And so, you know, I have said this before, but fathers are kind of the first one to say, like, go back upstairs and put more clothes on. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Our our father. Um, So you see that portion of it. But then even thinking through the 60s of, like, okay, what, what things were happening culturally uh, number one, I think it's early 60s, maybe 61, 62, uh, the FDA approves the pill. Um, so that's kind of the opening of the gates for uh, turning our culture into Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Um, because it was basically you can have sex with anyone and not get pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was an opening of the door. Clothing was changing. Uh, swimsuits and beaches were becoming, they had already become a huge part of culture. Yeah. But more and more clothing was being taken off. So uh, Jeff Pollard in his book, The yeah. Public Undressing of America, that was happening. Mm-hmm. Gentlemen, I think we all agree that there are few foods in the world as nutritious and delicious as some good eggs. You know, Brian, that's right. That's why I slunk at least 18 raw eggs a day. But with egg prices so high, one way to get great eggs at a good price is to invest in raising your own chickens. That's very true, Eric. Check out Ideal Poultry at idealpoultry.com if you want to place an order for some backyard chickens, ducks, or any other poultry, like pheasants or chuckers. I mean, come on, turkeys. They breed the best birds in the U.S. and are a lovely Christian family-owned and operated business. That's right. Visit Ideal Poultry at idealpoultry.com for all your backyard poultry needs. You see, really, I mean, foundationally and fundamentally, what's happening is that you're watching kind of the slow-motion apostasy of a culture, and you're seeing that worship really fundamentally matters, that when this humanity isn't ordered to the heavenly, when their their purpose, like Dan's talking about, what is your sexuality for? Who are you? What do you actually exist to be and do? What did God make you to be and do? When you throw off right worship of God the Father, it's in the Son and the Spirit, when you do that, again, it's a job opening, you will end up setting up other gods, and then you will worship them and become like them. Mm. You know, Eric, you, you've made this point, I think even last week on Twitter, you were talking about this in Exodus, where the immoral worship led inevitably to sexual immorality. 
where in Exodus 32, they're worshiping the golden calf, and then the people are naked and they're having an orgy. Yeah. So you see this straight line between false worship and then demonic sexual activity. That's why you, you, you hardly ever find ancient temples and peoples, whether it's the Greeks or the Hittites or the Canaanites or wherever you find it, South America, North America. Ancient, I mean, you find sexual practices that are perverted linked to worship. Yeah, Exodus 32, 31 and 32 is a good example. Romans 1, I mean, you kind of have the same thing. Before there's this sexual immorality, there's apostasy. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think just looking at our culture, if you see something like the 60s happening, you actually have to trace it further back, you have to go back. Yeah. and say, where was the apostasy? Yeah, there was apostasy that was happening, and so the fathers stopped shepherding their children into conformity with the, the, the son by way of the spirit, you know, through the spirit. To the, like, it's not Trinitarian anymore, where, they're, where God glorifies and dignifies his people, and they become truly human, where their sexuality isn't dimmed, but it's actually a true glory, right? Instead of that, they get the fathers either abandon or they actively uh, do harm by conforming their children to the image of the false god of whether it's mammon, uh, of you know, affluence and comfort and wealth, self-sufficiency, or uh, the chasing of sexual go- of this of new sex gods or whatever it is, you end up giving your children as sacrifices to be conformed to those gods. That's the inescapable principle. You will present your children to be conformed to the image of some gods. You will put your children on some altar. Mm. It's just a question of will it be the altar of present yourselves as living sacrifices to God, which is your spiritual worship and be dignified and glorified, made in the image of Christ, or will you be put on the uh, the off the altar of Molech or uh, in Mammon or some some other god that will strip away your dignity? And so, what what do you get? A culture out of the sixties. You, you get absolutely, you get pink haired, crazy. You know, you get absolute filth and disgust. You get ugliness. You get everything is degraded when it's pr- you've been promised glory. And you get degradation. Yeah, it's really interesting, too, because I, I think you can go back to the 60s and you can just trace in our culture where the church, I think uh, the Roman Catholic work, Humane Vitae, uh, was an early one saying, like, the pill is going to be a problem. And you look at the church fathers, and it's very uncomfortable for us to look at this. Yeah. But you can look at Calvin. Calvin absolutely forbade birth control mm-hmm. of, like, any form. So then you look at that and you go, okay, that feels so foreign to us because yeah. we're living in the wake of 1960 yeah. and the 60s. But I think what we've advocated and kind of it's been part of our ethos here, mm. if we want to rebuild Christendom, we can no longer as a church be following the world on yeah. sexual issues. Fathers have to act as fathers. This is why understanding these things, the roots of these things in the culture is so important because otherwise what will happen is is, you know, fathers out here, they're listening to this, church fathers, literal fathers, whatever, you're a father somewhere, you won't understand that you live in a cultus that's been forming your opinions on things. And so you're going to hear certain propositions that are actually good and godly and helpful, and you're going to think they're crazy. Like, <laughs> when, you, when you tell people, hey, you should really think about whether or not birth control at all is a good idea— People think you're crazy. Even a lot of Christians are like, in you're camp. insane. Yeah. And, and what they don't realize is that almost the entirety of the history of the church would say, what you guys are doing is utter God-pretending madness. It's idolatry. You have lifted yourselves up. You've thrown off restraint. You are you are dislocating and disconnecting uh, sex from righteousness and from its proper end. I mean, like, all of those things are happening, and we're often blind to them because we've been put on the altar— of the sex gods by our fathers. And so you have to understand these things. You have to understand where the 60s came from, what they did to our background assumptions, and see that those come out of worship if you are to recover good Christian fruitful fatherhood. Yeah, it's also really interesting because when you look at the downfall of the Roman Empire and the Egyptian empires, um, they were very closely related to, you know, people talk about monetary policy, all that's true. But sort of the number one issue in Rome was uh, they were no longer reproducing. Yeah. So reproduction, you can look at American culture. We're simply not even replacing, uh, even with all, the, you know, that's why we have immigration, all that stuff. Well, you do notice in pagan cultures that children often suffer very, I mean, like the Aztecs, we've talked about yeah. that before. Yeah. You know, they're sacrificed. 
So, so now you can see uh, where you were going with this. Uh, you know, we're not replacing ourselves. We're not having kids. With we consider death, them a curse. Cultural death. Yeah, we see them as a curse. So either they don't exist, or thanks to the 1960s, you have them and you can conveniently just murder your child. Yeah. Yep. No mistake that Ro- or it's, it's not a, an accident that Roe v. Wade follows, that an absolute culture of death follows. And then something interesting happens in, in this whole trajectory because it's kind of baked in. Once you do some things culturally, once you do point A, you're going to get to point Z, whether you like it or not, eventually. So once you hate wisdom, for example, you're always going to get to death somewhere. You love death. What's interesting is the way this happens – is that when you throw off fatherhood and people start – they reject, they apostatize from the Christian faith, for example, in our culture, they give in to rampant sexual morality. They start worshiping sex gods and death gods and mammon and comfort and malaise and excess, and they just go completely profligate in all of their seeking pleasure because all you have then are neurons and pleasure-seeking behavior at that point. You stop having kids because they're hard. You stop having kids. You start killing the kids you have. And, and then instead of having children to take care of their fathers, you actually end up having to make the state your God. You have to get to a welfare state eventually because who else is going to take care of you? The, the biblical pattern is that mothers and fathers would care for their children, and then in their old age, the children and their children's children would care for them, and then there'd be inheritance handed down. And there's this intergenerational cycle of life what happens when you cut that off? The state has to intervene on both ends. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And Brian, it brings us nicely to our third point, third cause for fatherlessness, which is what I'm calling a welfare state of mind, that the state has replaced the father in our culture. And it's interesting when you look at the 1960s, because the breakdown of the family and fatherhood, you, you can trace this through data, goes to about early to mid-1960. And one of the big features was 1964 and Lyndon Johnson's great society. Mm. So this was sort of taking some of the stuff FDR had done with the new deal. And, yeah. New yep. deal. And just putting on absolute steroids. Well, it's really interesting. They can trace the data directly. There's articles on this as welfare pay up payouts go up. Fatherlessness goes up yep. with it because as Doug points out in his book, you are subsidizing fatherlessness. Yeah. You're and, and like to use the unsterilized historical term, you're subsidizing bastards. Yeah. You're making bastards. You're saying, well, they'll be physical bastards. They won't have a father. So the state will be the one who steps in and tries to make you, you know, <laughs> legitimate, make you a legitimate son. But you're not a legitimate son of a good earthly father. You're the legitimate son now, supposedly, of daddy government. Yeah, really interesting article from the Institute for Family Studies. I'll quote from this. They say in the article from 1890 to 1950, and this focuses on uh, black children, by the way, from 1890 to 1950, black women had a higher marriage rate than white women. So obviously that's a problem today, but it wasn't always that way. Yeah. And in 1950, just 9% of black children lived without their father. By 1960, the black marriage rate had declined, but remained close to the white marriage rate. In other words, despite open racism and widespread poverty, strong black families used to be the norm. But by the mid-1980s, black fatherlessness had skyrocketed. Today, only 44% of black children have a father in the home. Unbelievable. In unison, the rate of black out-of-wedlock births went from 24.5% in 64 to 70.7% by 1994, roughly where it stands today. So this is unbelievable increase. 7 out of 10 chance that you were born out of wedlock if you're a black American. Yeah, just insane. And so the article goes on kind of drawing the conclusions more clearly for us. It says, one contributor to a family breakdown, which soon spread to the poor and working class white family, may have been, well, may have been, welfare expansion. Cash welfare in meager form existed since 1935, and some welfare took place during the Kennedy administration. But under Johnson's Great Society, which again was in 1964, benefits became substantially more generous and came under greater control of the federal government. So... What's going on here? Do you guys agree? Thoughts? I think one interesting thing that you can see is again, it's cyclical. You 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 do you kill the father in one area and you have to kill him more in another area. So here's this is gonna be the most based take probably that I say today. Oh wow. But when you get rid of the fathers by making the women vote, 
then they will vote in these emotionally driven welfare policies thinking, I'll help. Oh, there's poor people. I'll help. Let's vote. Come on, guys. So you have a father at the top, FDR and then Lyndon Johnson. You have a daddy somewhere, and he's manipulating all of the women voters yes. to get welfare policies that wouldn't have been passed by male vote. Like almost and none of these things would have been passed by male only voting. So so you end up with a matriarchy that's actually it's funny because there's a patriarch at the top. The matriarchy is always there's you can't get rid of the patriarchy <laughs> fully. But they it's cyclical. You have the the women voters who are then killing the the fathers in the culture by subsidizing fatherlessness, creating men who are easier to manipulate now because you can say, oh, honey, you know, free sex and don't care about the kids because I can kill them or the state will take care of them, making weak men who no longer have the marriage maturity pathway, and they just perpetually content, you know, remain as animals, as men who just they breed and then they leave. They're wild beasts. It's interesting because you, you read all these articles even today, you know, and they're to the tune of where have all the good men gone. Yeah. And then the reality is, well, y you drove them away. You subsidized them into non-existence or mm -hmm. at least in the form of the traditional father. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really interesting about the voting record. Zach Garris says this in Masculine Christianity, but when women were made to vote, they're thrust into the civil – the civic sphere. Yeah. They're really put in a position where they have to act like men in the public sphere. Yeah. Prior, they were protected mm -hmm. and they were honored and the men took care of them. It's interesting, though, you can look at this in voting records even today, I think in the last election cycle. Mm -hmm. It's something like 70 plus percent of the people voting for all the leftist garbage is women. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't have had like a single major Democrat policy pass for like 100 years. I don't even think that's an overstatement. I think you can look at the the maps. What what would the electoral college have looked like? The votes looked like in any presidential election with only the men voting, and it's like red. I mean, the whole and I'm not saying that the Republicans are like the great hero that would save us. I absolutely, don't put your trust in horses. But when you compare the the policies, who is it that is driving? Who is being wooed and manipulated? by the policymakers to pass their policies that really end up just the women are giving away their own sovereignty. They're saying somebody else, gov you know, gov daddy government, govern me harder, please. That's what they're saying over and over and over and over and over. They still want a father. They just want it to be the state. They don't realize that's what's happening because women are more easily deceived. Yeah, I think it's an interesting feature. I know, I think I've mentioned this before in past episodes. Uh, I think it was last season. Um, but one of the interesting features when Francis Schaeffer, this is towards the end of his life, he shares a cab with R.C. Sproul. Sproul asks him, hey, what's the biggest threat to America? So this is like the 1980s. What's the biggest threat facing America today? And he said statism. Mm -hmm. You can follow, I think, some great thinkers like Rush Dooney. Everything that was on Rush Dooney's mind was statism. Uh, he had studied the Native American populations and shown what statism, seen what statism had done there. Yeah. So I think there were some people that were awake to that. I'm not so sure, though, Dan, that the that the church as a whole understands, because it's the air we breathe, we don't understand how bad statism is for the family. So I just want to rephrase the question that we've been talking about. Why is a welfare state so bad for fathers and families? Yeah, it is really interesting, Brian, that you bring up women's suffrage and the submission of women to an entity you know, to the patriarchy, to yeah. the father or something like that, because you, you still have this, this class of people that still want more of what they've made. Yeah. Like they see the issue in the black community, especially as like, you know, fatherlessness, uh, we need to give them more, you know, and just like pouring on more support for the, for the families. Thomas Sowell in his book, uh, black rednecks and white liberals, he, he says this, he says white liberals, instead of comparing what has happened to the black family since the liberal welfare state policies in the 1960s were put into practice, compare black families to white families and conclude that the higher rates of broken homes and unwed motherhood among blacks are due to a legacy of slavery. And so you can see that that narrative yeah. still today is like the whole narrative from the state as they continue to engulf more and more of the role of being a father yeah that they're they're able to make this this uh this whole culture of shame to say like hey back off because it was your fault it was your ancestors fault that 
that the, you know, the black community is in the state it's in, you know, because you're racist. And if you don't vote for this, you're racist. So they still pl they play this shame and manipulation tactic. You can see this, I mean, through all sorts of propaganda from different Marxist governments in the past. I mean, this is just a common play that is um, that these governments take because they're going to have to rule by shame. And so we we obviously feel that today, you and know. I, and, I, and I think it's hard as part of the, the teaching and the education process for our people is helping people understand the play that's being run. Yeah. So you're, you're trying to get them to focus on a slavery that doesn't exist anymore. And that blinds them to the fact that Papa government is the slave master. Yeah, he's the slaver. They are controlling you in yeah. almost every way. They're the ones that created this problem in your community. Yeah. Right. So, so the government incentivizes fatherlessness. And then they say, don't worry, we'll take care of your children. We'll educate them. Yeah. We'll teach them how to be a functioning human being. Yep. And obviously we, we see the trajectory that, that that goes. And then economic policies, as they steal from you, um, you know, through inflation and, mm -hmm. and unjust taxation, and you you're feeling the pinch, and they're like, "Don't worry, Daddy will give you some money. You know, Daddy yeah. will give you some cash. You know, you you've got a little kickback coming. Oh, you need help paying for your college? We can do that. Yep. You know, you need a loan? That's fine. We'll give you a a, a cheap loan. You know, things like that. So you have the government just <laughs> continuing to to swallow more and more and it more. It's now common knowledge that our welfare system has itself become a poverty trap a creator and reinforcer of dependency. It makes me furious the more you think about how all of this fatherlessness interlocks with it. It's actually not fatherlessness. It's just, the again, the dislocation from lots of good earthly fathers to this one big divine state father. It all interlocks. They promise you Social Security to get rid of the need for generational care of the elderly, inheritance and wealth, then through taxation, property taxes, they steal and make it harder for you to say, no, thank you, Social Security. I'll take care of my own people. I'll give them an inheritance, and I'll give them a legacy. They destroy that mechanism. Then they subsidize child uh, bastard children. They subsidize fatherlessness and sexual immorality. And then they subsidize the status education to propagate all of it. And then you need more policemen to take care of all these fatherless criminal children. So then we need property taxes to be higher to continue paying for more and more state education, more and more prisons, more and more pris a police state. And so until all you have is pretty much 70% of your income is being stolen by the state in order to continue to fund fatherlessness and its corrosive social effects. So you have this complete, again, if you, if you get A, the hatred of wisdom, the rejection of the divine fatherhood of God, you're ultimately going to get Z, which is total slavery and death. You're going to get it. It's just a matter of time at that point. And so what people don't realize, I think, now in connecting all of these dots is that whether we're at M or R or Q, we're going to get to Z. You, a society cannot work that rejects the divine fatherhood of God ultimately. It will collapse in on itself into total slavery. Yeah, I think that's a phenomenal point. Uh, one of the other things to mention here is I think this is why, correct me if I'm wrong, we've said that the solution to this root cause problem is actually just biblical productive households with patriarchy uh, being an overriding dominant feature there. But I want to ask why productive households are so important as we think of like how do you combat jab of the state? Well, localism, yeah. local communities. But I think really central to it, the pillar of this new Christendom is going to be productive households. Yeah, uh, That would be my contention. But uh, maybe, Dan, we'll start with you. Agree, disagree. Is the productive household the way to compete jab of the state? Yeah, I mean, the you know, we're, we're talking about the, the mismanagement and, and all encompassing state, you know, swallowing up the role of father, but there wouldn't have been like Brian has said, a job opening. If fathers at home had just been good fathers, yeah. if they had been productive at home, if they had taught their children to fear the Lord, yeah. if they had educated their sons, if they had taught their daughters modesty and chastity, you know, and how to be a functioning human beings mm -hmm. and given them an identity, if that hadn't been abandoned, then there would be no job opening. Yep. There would be no politicians that would that would be able to pass legislation yeah. like what we have today. And so this this whole project that we talked about last season of of the new Christendom has to be a bottom up. It's not a top down. It's not like, hey, if we get the right 
president, politician, senator, you know, Senate majority, whatever it is, House committee, then then that'll fix everything. N- no, 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 no. It has to be a bottom up. Repentance has to happen for people, individuals, for households, for churches and communities. And then you're looking at cities and states and then, Lord willing, the nation. And so it must be from the bottom up. And the thing is, like, when you have, even with our current policies, I mean, a productive household with a good father is going to raise potent sons and daughters. They're going to raise young men with zeal, with knowledge. They know what who they are and what they're for. They know that um, someone was telling me this this morning. He was listening to an interview from a Navy SEAL. And the Navy SEAL said, uh, men who are not afraid to die are the most dangerous men. And he said, my life, I died with Christ. I'm already dead. Those men are to be feared. And so if you have a generation of sons that are raised by good godly fathers in productive homes, meaning that they're self-sufficient, they're not relying on the government for every all of their needs, then you you raise a whole generation of sons that know that who their real father is. They know that it's it's God the Father, not the father of the state. And they're already dead. Their life is hidden with Christ. Mm. So they cannot be controlled. They cannot be manipulated. You cannot twist them and shame them because Christ bore their shame. Christ bore their sin. They know that they're guilty sinners and they're continuing to walk in repentance. And so it has to begin at the household. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, great point, Dan. And it ties into our fourth point, which I'm calling a house divided. This is another root cause of fatherlessness. A house divided the Industrial Revolution and the post-World War II era. So this is tied very closely, Brian, to a productive household because fathers were sent off to factories. It brought them out of the home. Children, uh, almost simultaneously with a lot of this, were sent to public schools. And then eventually, especially post-World War II, the women were also sent into the factory sort of to never return home. So really the, the societal things that for many centuries and thousands of years had knit together the productive household and what Wendell Berry would call an economy of love, this has sort of been torn asunder. So one of the questions I have for you, Brian, is as you think about it, – it's sort of uh, to, to quote one of your favorite movie series in The Avengers – Oh, uh, please don't put that that mojo on me. So one of the things Thanos says is, "I'm inevitable." I don't know who Thanos is. I'm I'm not I'm not exaggerating. I, I do not know who Thanos is. Ignite. He's a bad guy. I, okay, thank you. He's a bad guy. Go ahead, go on. He says he's inevitable. A lot of people with the Industrial <laughs> Revolution, we may feel like it's it's like statism. It's just inevitable. We can't fight back against it. Against the power of mortal, there can be no victory. Join with him, Gundam. Industrial Revolution happened post World War II. It's impossible to send women back to the homes and for men to rule productive households. So, my question for you is do you see this as a root cause and do you see it as, uh, you know, inevitable? It is not inevitable. It is a root cause. <laughs> it is not inevitable. It is a root cause. You see the, the creeping statism. Every step further towards the displacement of fathers, real fathers, Christian fathers with, you know, the statist father, the the fatherhood of the state, um, it makes it harder to get back. Every step is a further hindrance, right? It is so difficult to bring your wife home, to educate your own kids, to start a school. When we started the school here in Ogden, guys, it's very difficult. It's like we're all paying crazy property taxes that are ballooning year after year. Property taxes are now thousands of dollars per year higher than they were when I first started owning property as an 18-year-old, right? It's now astronomically higher. I think my current taxes are four times higher than they were on equivalent property than they were in 2009 or so when I started, yeah. when I bought my first place. Well, even even my home, I've owned since 2016, and they've doubled. It's doubled. Yeah, since 2016. T- 2016. Right. Yep. So we're, we're getting to the point now where many people are paying $1,000 or $500 or more a month just for the privilege, quote-unquote, of owning their own house that they already are supposed to own. That all gets much harder than to keep your children home because you have to pay for all the other fatherlessness at gunpoint or go to prison. 
That's the reality. And there are no strong men to stand up and say to the school moms, no, we just won't. Nobody is going to stand up. Actually, it's funny, in this case, to the predominantly female uh, city council of West Haven, where Dan lives. I'm pretty sure it's almost, is it 90% female? Yeah, it's almost all. So Dan is governed by Even mo- the males. By moms. <laughs> Even the males. So it makes it harder, but it's not inevitable. What it does require, though, is you actually have to stand up and you have to keep saying no over and over and do the hard thing. It's really difficult, though. Like, I don't want to minimize how hard it is to bring your wife home, retake education, and start chipping away. But there's no other way. Yeah, and there's a lot of opportunity right now. So it might seem mm-hmm. impossible yeah. right now, but there was, a, there was an article that just came out a few days ago. And it says that public school enrollment drops by 1.4 million students. This is recent. Dub. Yes. That's a dub. Yeah, so even even like looking at the the gigantic Department of Education and the public school model, it's collapsing. Yeah. And 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 to Brian's point about, earlier about like we're at, you know, M or wherever we are in the alphabet and Z is inevitable, just because public school enrollment drops or because women aren't in the workplace doesn't yeah. mean you actually have like a righteous society. Yeah. But what it means is that there's a lot of opportunity. Yep. There's a lot of opportunity. So, I mean, potent homes and fathers will. I think I see opportunity in two areas as well for kind of undoing some of the industrial revolution. We've actually gotten to this point where because of really telecommunications that many people can work from home now. So that's number one. You can kind of live anywhere and do a lot of jobs. So that would allow you to focus on localism. It would allow you to be around your own home more during the day, not going physically to another location. That, that would be a positive, I would argue. Uh, the other one, though, is hand labor. Um, so people who work in the trades, like it's, it's ironically, Rory Groves was correct with durable trades, that plumbers and electricians, these things are more needed than ever. And, yep. and so few people are doing them. So I think the opportunity to start businesses yep. that you could, you know, train your sons to work in and actually make really good money while being local in your area, working together with your people I think there's more opportunity there was when I was, say, in high school. Yep. Um, it, it seemed like corporations were still really big. People are starting to see the other side of that. And, and the thing is, all of this starts with just taking responsibility to to act righteously and courageously where you are. I think about a group of like five people. I think it's about five right now in Ogden City. They all go to our church, <laughs> spearheaded by Base Jace. And uh, they are right now single-handedly – bringing a $240 million government dongle to its knees by filing a referendum that no one has even requested the form to file for 15 years, according to the city office. Really? And it's Ben Garrett. It's it's these guys. They got together to live in Ogden. I'm not an Ogden citizen right now. I live, like, in a city right outskirts of Ogden. Um, But they're basically saying the government's trying to do this Almost three hundred million dollar development. That's dumb. The government has no business doing it. Wait, the government. The government. Is doing yeah, it? the government owns the land. The government's building everything. They're building yeah. it. They're paying well, the developer. Paying, paying the developer. Is it for commercial? It's for yeah, commercial. They're claiming it's going to be great, whatever. But what they're doing is they're just robbing people. They're raising taxes. They're raising home valuations ex- exorbitantly, and not lowering tax rates. In some cases, raising them like Dan's last year. And, and so they're taking all of this property tax money, and they're using it for development, too. They're like, we're going to go build new police departments, new ev- blah, 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 everything. And we've got five people right now in a city of over 100,000. And they are the, – the developer personally sought a meeting with one of them to say, no. you are going to stop this whole project. Please don't do yeah, this. If you file this, it will stop. And, and that's don't. five men. That's true. Five Christian families. Wow. So it's like, listen, I don't know if they'll win in the end. I'm not making this like a whole Rocky. Is is Rocky an underdog story? Oh, yeah. Okay, haven't oh, yeah. seen Let's it. make it a Rocky story, <laughs> yeah. Let's make it a Rocky story. Rocky Maybe it will by the way. The tiger. It's Rocky the beats the- Thanos. Thanos? Rocky, yeah. Brian, Why couldn't you just what... be a normal person to make a Melkor reference or a Sauron or something? I don't know who those people are. You know who Sauron is. <laughs> Come, <guys> <laughs> Come on. Come on. You and your Silmarillion. Ah, you got me. You got me. Yeah, so definitely anyway. opportunities there. Um, some Rocky-esque Thanos opportunities that Brian has <laughs> underscored. Oh, my <laughs> word. I'm Once again, for the second time this episode, I quit King Saul. <laughs> I quit King Saul. Uh, we do have a job opening. As Brian said before, there's always job openings. <laughs> Everybody's replaceable. The pay is 
not great. Though. It is <laughs> not <laughs> great. But the eternal benefits. Eternal rewards. Eternal. Benefits eternal. are eternal. Eternal. Yeah. Which brings us to number five, causes, root causes of fatherlessness. And that is institutionalizing fatherlessness in stone tablets, i.e. legal structures in America. So oh, we've talked about yeah. some of these things, uh, birth control being legalized and made available to the public. But some other really important ones in the 1960s include no-fault divorce. Yeah, uh, You have the sexual revolution. You have feminism, which has really taken over every ESG board, it seems, and every corporation and every facet of our uh, society. Uh, we mentioned before women's right to vote thrust them into the public sphere. And all of this was working to weaken fathers and their authority. Really interesting here. We'll talk about feminism in a moment. But this one, I, I like wait. to I like to share this because most people are like, look, Ronald Reagan was the bastion, not just of conservatism, <laughs> but he is a Christian prince. <laughs> like all my youth growing up in the conservative movement, Ronald Reagan was the gold standard. It's hard to decide who's greater, Abraham Lincoln or Ronald Reagan. Yes. Agree, disagree. Where is the greater in great what or way? greatest? <laughs> Where is the barf button? We'll have to get on that one. <laughs> but very interestingly, the first no-fault divorce law was signed in the U.S. in 1969 by the governor of the gubernator of California, Ronald Reagan. Reagan, by doing so, made it easier and more convenient to absolve the family unit. So we take no-fault divorce for granted today that it's just a, a feature of our society. Yeah. But there was a time where you had to actually prove fault before a court of law. Yeah. To get a divorce, you couldn't just go down and say, I don't like this person anymore. We're getting divorced. The judge would have laughed at you and said, well, what's the cause? Is he abandoned you? Is he yeah. beating you? Is he failed to provide? What's the issue? And if, if you said, well, I don't like him, they would have said, that's cute. Get out of here. Yeah, go home. So no fault divorce is a big, big problem in America. I, I, I just now got that. Was that was a deep cut. Yep. Go. You home. know, I know Beth is a longtime listener of the King's Hall. That was for her. Yeah, that was that was for Beth. So let me ask you this on no-fault divorce in legal. Well, let's tie it to somebody that you met recently, yeah, Brian. Jeff. Jeff Younger. Maybe just fill the listener in on, like, who is Jeff? Why is it uh, related to this? Yeah, Jeff Younger is uh, – uh, I met him at a Manosphere conference thing where that actually a bunch of Christians – Ended up taking over. He, he's a Greek Orthodox gentleman, very, very convictionally Greek Orthodox. And, but he, he's just absolutely a man of courage. So his wife, uh, ultimately, like long story short, is essentially like divorced him trying to transition their child to another sex or gender, whatever the make-believe thing they're doing now is. So he's trying to transition their child. And Jeff has spent millions of dollars. He's like risked arrest and imprisonment to resist this conversion and the state has partnered with his with his wife to mutilate his child by the way texas this is texas in fact there's a standing injunction in texas on the books by the judge that jeff younger is not allowed to publicly speak about a series of issues and, and they're all political so they're he's all, thus ceased he's he's not and <laughs> he so of course he was ceased. he was an obedient son of the daddy state and he said yes daddy and he didn't do it no jeff actually told the judge which i think i'm pretty sure is a woman like, I know everybody at this point th thinks I'm a, r a raving sexist. No, I'm not. I actually just I I love glorious, godly womanhood and fem and and masculinity as well. But he told the judge basically, arrest me. Go ahead, go ahead. In fact, he's had his his papers ready to file in the next higher court that the injunction they've brought against him is wildly unconstitutional, which it is. And what's funny is he's been on everything from like the Daily Wire to conference after conference, like holding to political talk rallies, <laughs> talking about all the things they said. The lady was like, you're not allowed to talk about that. And he was like, OK, anyway. And then he went and he just did it oh, and no. danced anyway. on the injunction. And what I love about Jeff is that he's a picture of what one tenaciously stubborn, courageous, righteous man can do in bringing a whole system screeching to a halt. And, and basically call their bluff. And they haven't arrested him. They won't do it. But he's, it's such a good example of what you're talking about here, of legal structures in America that are legally kidnapping his child from him, is how I would put it. They are legally kidnapping his child. And they're actually legally trying to murder his child. Because when you mutilate somebody, when you try to kill their whole identity, they even call it dead naming. 
Really? They're trying to murder yeah. his child. I mean, this is the state kidnapping and attempted murder on a child. And can he call the police and say, hey, they're trying to do this to my kid. They're poisoning him with, with hormones, and they're trying to cut his genital, you know, all of that. He's got nothing. He can't. He spent millions of dollars, <laughs> and he can't stop them from doing it. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Uh, I, I've known through pastoral counseling and just friends. You, you, we probably have all have heard these stories. But I was talking to one gentleman, and, you know, just a sad situation. He's got two kids. Um, his wife has custody most of the time. I said, uh, how, what happened with the divorce? What, what's going on? He goes, well, here's the thing. My, my wife cheated on me like three times. She filed for divorce, and now I pay astronomical alimony. I rarely get to see my kids, and the court just assumes in all of it that she's right. So this is what I mean about the, the reason a lot of men, I think wrongly but understandably, have gotten blackpilled is because they're starting to realize, wait, the system is actually rigged against men. I think that as pastors, you have to know those things. You have to help your people not give in to despair, but you do have to know what what the rules on the playing field are, and, the, and they're not even. So I guess, Dan, just, just to kick that to you, um, how is it that you think men should respond knowing that these things are the case, right? Do you do you go black pill? We've talked about this before, the men going their own way. You know, this, marriage is a bad deal. We don't do that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've seen a. I saw a post recently. I'm sure we've all seen it if you've been on social media for any length of time. Where it's like, you know, the the system is rigged. Therefore, don't get married. Yeah, just use women. You know, for your own satisfaction. Uh, don't have kids because why would you raise them in such a horrible place? Like, especially if you have sons. You know, it's going to be awful. It's just like, wow, that guy is as bad, if not worse, than an atheist. He has no identity. He has no reason why he, why he exists. Yeah, it's such a good point. I think part of the Christian response, like Christianity, seems like one of the flavors we ought always to have is, listen, Christians throughout our history and, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, whatever, have always been people who know how to respond in the midst of extreme persecution and adversity, right? This isn't new in the, like, look at the, the Hebrews under Pharaoh, right? Where did they have a great deal where the system was set up to favor them? Mm. No, but did they? You know, they were still called to be faithful, obedient, keep having kids, keep leaning into biblical sexuality. Yeah, but, I mean, I mean, a lot of the the policies that we've been talking about have little to no direct effect on my home. Right. Right. No fault divorce does not affect my my home. You know, public education system doesn't affect my home. This they still still steal money from me. Yeah, they rob you. They rob me, but but my kids aren't being indoctrinated by by the state. You know, so there's there is you know, all of us uh that are Christian fathers who, you know, back to the early earlier point about productive households, like those policies do exist and they may steal from you, yeah. but they can't win the hearts of your children and they can't kill your marriage. Yeah. And so you unless just have you to fear them. God and let you, unless you let them. You that's, have to take right. radical responsibility. Absolutely. That's the answer. Yeah. And a lot of the, the MGTO guys, the men go their own way, the black pill guys, what they, they hate it when you say that. Take radical responsibility. Because they say, we're doing that and it's not working. And there's still risk and there's still failure and there's still potential for getting absolutely destroyed and crushed. And it's like, I mean, that's yes. A, that's actually a really adolescent response. Yeah. To say like, oh, but it's not my fault. I'm going to make it's an not excuse. My fault. It's not my fault. Yeah. It's like, well, actually, you're responsible for that, too. You're responsible for the time. You know, it's like Gandalf says, you, of course, nobody chooses to live in hard, ridiculously difficult times. Nobody chooses that. You just have to be faithful to the Lord where you are. You have to be faithful where you are. You have to be faithful in a world of no-fault divorce. It does mean you need to be cunning. It does mean you need to be wise. It does mean don't marry someone quickly. Yeah, It does mean you need to get yourself in a community where there is a, a mechanism for cultural transmission that will create high-quality spouses for your children. It means all of that, and it's still, even with that, there are no guarantees. If you want guarantees or I'm going to take the black pill, you're going to take the black pill every time. Yeah, because it's there expedient. No. Yeah, it's expedient. It's, 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 it's easy. It's the easy. It's the giving up, whatever. I'm, not, I'm going to take my toy and go home. It's like, okay, thank you. The rest of us will attempt to save civilization. Right. While you go home. 
Yeah, I think one of the movies, we'll probably do more on this later, but uh, that Dan had mentioned, we were talking about was Cinderella Man. Uh, James J. Braddock, boxer, uh, loses everything. He's in a bad situation, as were millions of Americans during the Great Depression. One of the features of his fatherhood that I love in the, the movie the Cinderella Man is that he, ne- like, there's zero self-pity. He's just like, this is the hand we were dealt. Mm-hmm. You respond, you fight, you do the best you can. And I think, Dan, for a lot of the men in our generation, that's kind of a picture for what we would say to them is this is that's this kind of time is now. Yeah, yeah. The stories that win your heart, like that you want to emulate. And and one of the scenes from that movie. So Jim Braddock, he's he has to work on the docks. He's not uh, his boxing career is, you know, pretty much done at, at this point uh, in the film. And so he's he's just trying to get like daily work at the docks and he gets selected, you know, sometimes. And he wakes up and his daughter is eating some fried bologna and he has some fried bologna and she's still hungry. And so he gives her his breakfast and says, it's okay, sweetie, I'm full. full. I had a dream where I was at the steakhouse and I had a (laughs) huge steak, you know, Uh, and I ate the whole thing. I'm stuffed. And then he goes to work like a 12 hour shift. mm. And, and it's stories like that, that win your heart, you should look at that story and say, yeah, times are hard. I wish that I had it easier. I wish that I had a pension, you know, and a really good paying job and inflation didn't stink and that it, you know, women, you know, virtuous women were, were easier to find than they are now. Like there's a whole lot of things that we wish, but, but the times are hard. Mm -hmm. That's just not reality. And to wish for times that don't exist is a fool's game. Mm -hmm. And so I think you just have to look reality in the face and say, I've been dealt a hard hand, and it's times like these that great men are forged. I will not be like the rabble that just disintegrates during the Great Depression Mm -hmm. and just becomes drunk, you know, just tries to make, like, whatever cheap hooch they can, and they just abandon their families and leave because things are too hard. Instead, the call is to come further up and come further in to the Christian faith, which means that you take responsibility for those that are under you, which means that, you know, in a sense, like you go hungry and you still work hard and you don't complain and you have a smile on your face and you take dominion for Christ in your small corner of the world by just taking responsibility. Hmm. Yeah, I love that, Dan. And, and it really is it's an opportunity for men in difficult times to win glory for God and for themselves, for their family. Uh, speaking of families, number six, we've got two more points to get through. Uh, number six, we've spoken, Brian, about this a little bit, but public education in yeah. particular is designed, it's very <clears throat> warp and woof, is to designed to undermine a father's authority. So I wanted to read a quick, uh, this is from an excerpt in a news article. Um, in 2021, right, we had the dust up in Fairfax County, Virginia, over sexually explicit material that was being taught to young children. So I'm going to quote from the article. It says, here's the context. An upset parent in Fairfax County showed up to a school board meeting with two books she had pulled from her child's high school library. The books were shockingly graphic, far beyond pornography, and even contained explicit pedophilia. When she read from the book, the board members asked her to stop because the content was so deeply disgusting. This is what they were teaching to, like, kindergartners. Here's the kicker, though. The article goes on. Democrat Terry McAuliffe said, quote, I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach, end quote. So Doug reacts. Well, now Brian reacts. Um, most of my immediate thoughts cannot be published <laughs> due to restrictions uh, placed upon me by the ju- – no, I'm just kidding. That's, um, that's actually – what it's shocking, but it also shows the underlying assumption they have that, again, the state – is the primal authority here. They're the father. Not the parent, right? They And the state even has a duty, take Jeff Younger's case, the state has a duty to protect the child from the father. And 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 there is, a again, the best lies are wrapped in a half-truth. The state does have a legitimate God-given authority to protect children, even from their parents in some cases. But it's just, what is their definition of when that should take place? What is evil? Like, yeah, uh, sexual abuse absolutely we stone them right that's we stone the parent like okay cool 
the state has just stepped in. The city fathers have stepped in. They said, bring them outside the gate. Two or three witnesses. It's been established. Okay, um, they're fertilizer now. But but what they've done is they've called good evil and evil good, and so now they're enforcing evil at sword point, at governmental gunpoint. And so I think, again, like, good for this parent, though. I don't know if they're a Christian. I don't know what what led them to to take this before the school board. But it's like you have to understand, Christians, that, again, radical responsibility requires us to go and do the inconvenient hard thing and be the guy stepping out in front of all of the powers and saying, no, we're not going to allow this, and then make them react to you. Because what this did, like it's been a year plus since this happened, there have been countless uh, copycats now, you could say, people who said they were inspired by it, and they went and took similar action. Now, is that going to fix everything? No, not by itself, but culture is a huge ship. It takes a while to turn. If, if in, over the next generation we had more and more and more of that, we could flip the script and do what the LGBTQ lobby did where less than 1% of the population held the other 99% hostage and, and made sweeping social change. So Christians absolutely do need to understand that worship is, is warfare, that culture flows out of cultists. We need to understand all of that, but we also need to understand that you actually have to take tactical, real, and often political action in these areas if you are going to win. So you do start the school and then you do go to the school board meeting. Like you do both. And uh, that's uh, that that's the only way I think that we can be uh, adequately given an answer for our Christian faith when we stand before the throne in the last day and say what did you do? Yeah, and one thing Brian I think I would say uh my friend Brandon he's a pastor in Alabama um when all this was going down with Fairfax he said you know I was I was so encouraged to see the moms stand up and fight for their children. But he said, I just had one aching thought as I was watching the whole thing. He said, where are the fathers? Where's the dad? They, they literally weren't, I mean, some of them were there. And I think there was like one dad who spoke. Yeah. But for the most part, it was moms. Mm. We had had similar things that I had seen in the news in Alabama, where it's like, you know, the moms would rise up because of the woke teaching in the schools. Yeah. And the moms would be at the school board meetings. And it was the same question. Where are the fathers in the midst of this? And it's not shame on those shield maidens of Rohan. No. Good for them. Yes. But they shouldn't have had to be the ones who were doing that. The men should be there as well. And I think the other thing we would say, we can talk more about public education in another episode, but it's going to be a fight. This is why things like St. Brennan's exist, but they exist because there's been, by you guys and Kevin and other people, blood, sweat, and tears on something that's really not easy. It's not the easy path if you're going to take control of the education of your family. Mm -hmm. So I think that is uh, important. The The last thing that we'll talk about, gentlemen, uh, number seven, the media machine rages against the father. So we there's countless examples of how parenthood and fathers are looked down upon in the media. Uh, kind of the typical trope is the Homer Simpson, right, where dad, the American dad is just a moron. Yeah, uh, He's stupid, and it really, you know, Bart and Homer – I'm thinking of one episode I watched as a kid where Bart and Homer put pots on their head and they just keep banging into each other, which actually seems kind of funny. Uh, but meanwhile, it's like uh, Lisa and then Marge, like the mom and the sister, have to be the ones to like hold it together and be smart and be wise and think about the future and not do certain things like that. One of the other examples, kind of funny, kind of not, is the progressive commercial with Dr. Rick. You, even if you don't know what that is, you've probably seen the commercials. Right, Dr. Rick, quote, helps keep you from becoming your parents. So, Dan, a lot of funny commercials. I looked this up. He's actually got an ebook and an audio book called Dr. Rick Will See You Now. And it is titled The Essential Guide to Unbecoming Your Parents. Again, pretty funny ads. The one I saw the other day was like a guy was in his driveway labeling his trash cans. And we can all think of suburban fathers that we've laughed at. And he said, um... You're taking a lot of care for your trash cans. The guy was like, "Well, you can never be too safe." And he was like, "With your trash?" <laughs> I don't I don't understand. But it's a really interesting Dan underlying principle. We shouldn't become like our parents. So, uh Well, it, even as in like an insult. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, but, "Oh, you're just like your dad." Yeah, it's and like, it's it's sort of like the it's kind of like our our parents are going to be dorky and do really dumb things and you don't want to become like them. So, I guess just address that from uh you know, from our perspective. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's humorous because it is true. There's truth there. And those There's genuinely truth. were funny, some of them. Yes, they very are funny. funny. They were like the dorky things that your parents do. They were pretty funny. Yeah, but un- underlying, you're right, it does yep. show like, hey, Fifth Commandment is something that we don't care anything about. Yeah. You know, you can still laugh. I'm not saying that. Like the that the commercials are are in, intentionally training you to break the fifth commandment and you're gonna die very young. Yes. Like I, I, I wouldn't say <laughs> I wouldn't say that. But but it, there is this uh this cultural uh stigma that it, you know, you should not be like your parents. Mm. Like you should actually deny them. Funny that we've been talking about the nineteen sixties, because that's in a lot of ways what was at the heart of the movement was don't be like your parents. In fact, throw off all restraint that your parents had taught you and go to California and have free love, do drugs, yeah, you know, sexual revolution, like all of that. And so, I mean, it's still a, a stigma today. Well, it's really interesting, Dan, because the 1960s coincide perfectly with the baby boomer generation that TV was introduced in the 1950s, really started taking off in the 1960s. I think 1960s were the first color television, more channels, uh, that sort of thing. But it's interesting as you track those changes culturally, even in the 1950s, we had, you know, Leave it to Beaver, Ward Cleaver as the father, very wholesome family. Good dad. Um, it's, it's often interesting, Brian, even today that we're like, oh, so you want to return to the 1950s and Ward Cleaver? And I'm like, well, that'd, actually, be, a, that'd be pretty good. That would actually be a drastic <laughs> yeah. upgrade. Like, wait, you, you think it's bad? He They were married. They had children. He loved them. There was, they like, discipline. Didn't cuss, taught them stuff. That, that's what, and you want, like, the divorce not teaching their children cussing 13-year-old is shooting up heroin. Like, that's what you'd, <laughs> that's you'd prefer. What, that, so, we don't, so we don't get the 50s. That's what you want. Yeah, but, Brian, <laughs> thank God we were delivered from the 50s. Am but, I right? But think about all of the oppressed wives. You know, it's like— well, and it's interesting, too, because I was reading a study, uh, or I guess it was like an essay, a paper, on Betty Friedan. Uh, Betty Friedan, the feminine mystique, her big argument was that housewives were so unhappy. Well, somebody went back and did the research on her main study that she referenced. They went back, they read the original, and they're like, that study showed that like 85% of women who stayed home could have got jobs, didn't want them, mm-hmm. were happy at home, and felt fulfilled. <laughs> So even the whole thing but is— But, Eric, there were 15%. They were 15%. They were sad. The main thing I want to drive at here is the way that media— you can read a book like Amusing Ourselves to Death. Yeah, really good. The way that the media—we have no clue because it's the world we grew up in. The way the media shapes what we think about the world, how we view fatherhood. Think about somebody like, again, Homer Simpson or Peter Griffin from Family Guy. Dad is not the good guy in the stories. From 59 to 89 with Simpson to 99 with Peter Griffin. Yeah, it just keeps going. Even, um, I don't remember the movie, but Steve Carell was in it. I was watching it on a plane, and Steve Carell decides to stay home so his wife can go to work. And so he becomes a fami. He's a father mommy. Ha! Gay! Ugh, yeah. And, like, the whole movie is, like, he's an idiot who can't get it together, and his wife is really smart. I mean, this is, like, every movie— Everything you watch on TV, the guys are the idiots. You need a woman to step in and save you. The Star Wars uh, films got plagued by that same deal. Like, all the heroes in the end are the, are the women, which wasn't true in the early films. You know, it's, it's, it's really funny. You bring up the media and how it essentially catechizes people. Big time. Uh, because Pastor Sauvé here had written an article some years ago that is now known as, like, the— don't watch Netflix article, even though he yeah, which is literally said, not what I said. Yeah. You yeah. and John Piper. It's called <laughs> Netflix Catechesis and Parental Malpractice was the name of the, the article. So John Piper went a step further. His, I think in his, he said it's something like Netflix paves the road to hell. See, like, get mad at John Piper. Yeah, get mad what at are they mad at me for? Anyway, continue, Dan. I, I want to hear more about this. Oh, no, I don't remember what the article said at all. No, no, no. The main point was that that media... And entertainment isn't just some something that's nice. It's yeah. like food. Like, dessert's nice. But if all you do is consume dessert, you are going to look a certain way because you're feeding your body. Entertainment is the same way. It might be the dessert of, you know, of pleasure or whatever in life. Boy, I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, but you consume enough garbage and you become like it. Your preferences are shaped by it. I mean, this is what catechism does, is it builds a person. And their preferences, their likes, their dislikes, what is true, what is false, 
what is good and beautiful, you know, what is ugly. And so the the thing that you're noticing, the theme is like uh, that men are incompetent, fathers are dopes, women are powerful, women can do anything, women are economic drivers, and they always have to fix the men's mistakes. Every point it's dig, 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 dig at men, and then continue to try to prop up women into roles in which God did not design them They're to be in. They're not them. Yeah, exactly. And so it's showing you, like, it, in these movies and, and TV shows, we've all seen it, I'm sure, where you're watching a show, and all of a sudden there's, like, a, a, a lewd sex scene, and you're like, well, for that reason, I'm out. You know, you just have to put that in. Uh, it, because free love is supposed to be something that's a value. You should like this, is what they're saying, instead of finding it disgusting, you know? And so it, it the point of the article... And it was, if I'm not mistaken, that entertainment shapes shapes you like catechism. Yeah, it was actually, I now realize, I wrote two. That was an earlier one. The later one that really got us, got hot water was seven reasons to delete your Netflix. And it wasn't about never watching TV, but it was about this unconscious catechesis that's taking place that's actually making you stupid. It's making you lie about the nature of cultural relevance. Like, well, I won't be able to preach the gospel unless I... Like, remember when Mark Driscoll said, if you want to really be culturally relevant, you need to buy two DVRs. <laughs> and he was talking about, like, knowing everything in pop culture so you can preach the gospel. And it's like, when was the last time your knowledge of Nicki Minaj helped you share the gospel with somebody? Well, and that's the... Probably the, never. The, I hope you have no knowledge of Nicki Minaj. I'm ashamed I even know that name. The weird thing about... Mark, who? <laughs> I job, remember, man. like when C.J. Mahaney and John Piper and those guys were kind of in the process of correcting him. Mm -hmm. Mark had said publicly, like in a sermon, he's like, "Yeah, I probably like read and pray like less than five minutes a day." It, poor guy. And you were like, "Mark, like I'm thinking as a pastor, I'm so much more concerned that you have high Bible intake and prayer life than I don't know, say knowledge of MTV." Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, probably not good. And I think more recently. 2007, the introduction of the iPhone, that's really the, another, like TV, another change in telecommunications that has drastically reshaped our culture. Just a quick plug, I think fathers, you have a responsibility to pre protect your wives, your teenage daughters, your teenage sons. Do not give them a smartphone Don't if, do it. if you're young kids. And I mean, I have legitimately thought about this. As a church, how many problems does it cause versus how helpful? And... Like, let's go back to flip phones. <laughs> I mean, I, I think in a lot of ways it wouldn't harm us more than it would it would help us. So definitely some things to be thinking about. I read a recent study, and they were talking about young girls, like self-esteem, whatever, it's worse than it's ever been. But to phase out from the cultural way of describing it, their mental health is worse than ever. And this is not just women, but men. Suicide rates, depression are really high. They found that for young girls who committed suicide— the number one factor that they found among them was that they had no real-world relationships and their entire life was lived through social media on their phone. Mm. So, again, this would be a one for fathers of, this is just a root cause of our cultural decay and the fragility of our children. It hasn't helped them that they live life through a screen. Yep. Not good. Mm -mm. Yeah, there was another void there, right, was friends. And so, oh, we'll give you friends. We'll give you social media. You know, and so there was a that was a company, you know, that saw a void and they tried to fill it. And we feel like we have friends, but most people don't. Unless you're in this room right now with yep. the King's Hall. Gentlemen, the friendship is amazing. <laughs> what else is amazing in my life is the way Brian closes down a show. Oh, I thought you were going to yeah, guys, insert an listen, ad there is what it sounds what like. What a good transition. <laughs> and let me just say that sometimes... When you look deeply into the problems, you or are tempted. Or into your friend's eyes. I, I was going to say you're tempted to take the black pill, but that doesn't. <laughs> Eric, when I look in your eyes, that is exactly what I want. I like do. how you said nobody can close down a show like Brian and then interrupt him. <laughs> I'm so nobody sorry. can like, interrupt just... someone closing down a show like Eric. No, that's right. It's true, though. Sometimes when you start looking at the problems, it can get you angry and black pilled and... And you guys know that that is not the end all at the King's Hall. That's not the, the last thing we want to leave you with isn't just, wow, I'm mad or wow, that sucks. 
which is true. You should. Some of these things should make you angry, and some of them might make you say, well, that sucks. We do want to accurately diagnose the problems here that have been created in our society surrounding fatherhood, but we want to give you and provide and even begin the discussion in many cases on real blue-collar, practicable solutions. And so we're going to be talking about that in upcoming episodes here in this season. We're not just going to keep talking about the history and the problems. We're going to talk about solutions, restoring biblical fatherhood, restoring the right understanding and practice of the fifth commandment, even things like building generational wealth in a world that hates it to disrupt that cycle of daddy government, how to create churches that attract masculine men, train them to be righteous fathers, establishing rites of passage for our sons, and a lot more than that. So keep that dial on the King's Hall. I know you guys are all listening to this on an old radio set in your living room, so don't turn that dial. Don't change the channel. Don't unsubscribe from your podcatcher. It's probably a better way to put it. Stay tuned, and we'll open up the solutions uh, in the next episode and beyond. Remember, in the meantime, fest in Alente. Make haste slowly. We are going to need to hurry and get to work on these things, but it's a long project. We need a long obedience. We'll see you next time on the King's Hall.